Hello and welcome to Spooning with me, Mark Wogan. Each week I'm joined here at the Mount Street restaurant by a very special guest who will have food cooked for them by executive chef Jamie Shears. They will be trying spoons of things they've said they love and things they think they hate. The difference is they'll be wearing a blindfold. My guest this week is a woman of incredible talents. She is a mother, she is a style icon, and now she's a documentary maker. Will you please put your virtual hands together for one of Ireland's finest, Laura Whipple. Oh, what a great intro. And you call me a style icon when I'm sitting across from you. Well, I'm, I'm just a man in, in, in a furry jerkin, in a... whereas you are a woman in an <laughs> extraordinary called... jumper. It's called a gilet. Gilet. Well, no, it? It's a gilet, what you're wearing. It's yeah, gilet. It's a gilet, mm. yeah. Furry gilet. Say furry. It's nice to say, isn't it? Yeah, furry furry gilet. gilet. Now, a little bit about you before we get into the food. You were, of course, born in Dublin. Now, whereabouts in Dublin were you born? Exactly, like the hospital? Exactly. Exa- okay. Not the hospital. <laughs> you, you know, where... Well, I was born in Dublin, um, but I grew up in Bray, which is right. technically County Wicklow. It is. The Garden of Ireland. Uh, my dad, so I grew up with just my mom mm-hmm. in Bray, but she's a Wexford woman. And my dad was raised in Temple Bar. Uh, so literally the heart, the of, heart Dublin. of Dublin. And my nanny's flat for years. They're still there behind Ellison Castle. Um, there's these old flats uh, on a place called Astell's Row. I know exactly. And, what you mean. and uh, there's like a fishing tackle place there, Rory's. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. been there for years. And obviously, when my dad grew up there, it wasn't the <laughs> place it's now. The no. loud, full of no, parties no, and stags and really, hens. It was, it was a slightly seamy part of town. Yeah, it was a little bit different. But yeah. I always remember like this view outside my nanny's uh, flat was of the Hapenny Bridge, which is just such an iconic part of Dublin. Mm. So, yeah, so for me, I grew up in Bray. Mom's from Wexford. Dad's from Dublin. And, like, Wicklow's kind of the county in between. So, so dad was... Grew up in Glasnevin, really? near, 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 the, near the Ballymun flat. So I went to university at Dublin City University. So I used to um, live around there. Yeah. Well, yeah. my uncle, his brother, still lives there. Really? Still lives in the same house. Near, um, do you ever go to the Omniplex in Santry? No. I, <laughs> <coughs> no, I, I, I can safely cinema. say I have, they've got a good cinema yeah. there. And then I've got re- other relations. I used to go out as a kid, I would... You know, I was slightly challenging maybe as a teenager. So my, uh, it's your job to be challenging. Yeah. That's too Not as challenging as I was, but there we go. And I used to get farmed out to various relations all over. So I spent a lot of summers in County Carlow. No, oh, gorge. Where everyone's... Did you enjoy it? Um, Do you remember a fond memories? Or... Yeah, there were fond memories, but it was it was definitely a slower pace of life there. Yes. Everyone talks a little bit slower and they end every sentence with right so. But it is a lovely part of the world. And my husband just did an interview with an Irish presenter back at home. And he said, everything he said to me was, come here to me. He's a Kerry <laughs> man. He's like, come here to me. He's like, I'm here. What do, <laughs> what do you want from me? I'm like, no, that's just a, well, it's, it's a phrase. Well, it's like, it's like that London thing of, you know, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't you know, know what yeah. I mean? No, you, know. you haven't said it yet. Why, yeah. why do not? Why, know why should I know what this is? Yeah. There's a man I know who will use, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He'll say it about five times before he actually says it. What, what you and you're just there going, please just tell me because <laughs> I don't know. Just get to the point. And I did have to, because I moved over here 15 years ago and I really had to think about what I said because I would say things and people would look at me going, and I was on MTV at the time, and think, what? What, what have you just said? I'm like, is that is that an Irish thing or is that an English thing? I had to really think about what I was saying and slow down because some parts of Ireland speak slow, oh, other parts Mac very 90. fast. So that was, uh, that's me. You're the Mac 90 Yeah, part. I'm from the same place as Darrow Breen, so we talk a million miles an hour. Yes, he is a fast talker. Yes. Um, but both very intelligent people. Got a lot to say. A lot to say. Yeah. And saying, <laughs> it, saying it fast and people can't keep up. Get it in there. But you got, you got the MTV gig. <laughs> you won a competition, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I was studying in DCU in Glasnevin Mm -hmm. and um, I was in my final year and I had just uh, applied for an internship in News Talk, which is this news radio station. So I was in a newsroom, which um, great for learning, not the happiest place. I found it really hard. I found news really difficult, but I loved storytelling and I loved talking to people. Um, But was that, I mean, it's probably a commonplace question now, but do you think that's because you were a young woman in a male-dominated environment that it wasn't that comfortable for you? Or was it more to do with where you were in life at that point? 
I think I was young. I was like about 22. Um, and I think it's difficult anyway. The newsroom is very fast paced. Mm. I do think, you know, this young blonde 20 year old coming into that environment will probably come with his own prejudice. And uh, yeah, I was definitely made to do, but like any intern, not the, but did the you, great uh, jobs. Because you've done a bit of modeling. You're, you, yeah. you're, you're, you're not an unattractive woman. Let's be clear. I've, it you takes know, a lot those, of effort. For those who are listening <laughs> on a podcast and, and don't know what you look like, you're a good looking person. And did you find that hindered you? Um, I think with I think we all judge people on their appearance when we first meet them. Um, and anyone who says they don't is a liar because we all do. Um, have I been judged by how I look? I think so. Mm. But has that given me um, extra fire in my belly? Probably. But what I've noticed, because we met a f few years yeah. ago. I can't even pinpoint it. Like, I feel like a long, I feel like it was my early days coming, yeah. coming to over London. Yeah. And, and what I've noticed is you have seamlessly sort of moved into style icon. I, d I don't know. Who's calling me that besides you? I am. Okay. All right. No, but, he, but you know, you, you, you kind of talk about what you're wearing and people are celebrating what you're wearing. It's, it's kind of, it's been a, it's, it's been a change from yeah. just, you weren't that, it wasn't <laughs> such a folk. I'm not saying you were badly you dressed, <laughs> but I'm terrible. saying it wasn't, it wasn't as of much of a focus it's, for you. It's a weird one. I do think there's a female, um, male divide here. And when I was working with MTV, I was on telly every day. Mm. There was no stylist. Mm. There was no makeup artist, Mark. I was so naive to so many things um, in the industry, but I was having a lovely time. I almost enjoyed my innocence of being given a mic, sent off to LA to interview. First interview was Coldplay. Uh, I interviewed like crazy people, J-Lo, all of them, with like no hair or makeup, <laughs> getting changed in toilets. I was just so happy to be there. I, my, one of my first big gigs was the MTV Europe Music Awards. And I went to my friend's house, a girl who went to DCU as well, who was now living in London, with a bag and just borrowed all the clothes from her wardrobe. So I'd have enough clothes to wear when I was over in, I can't remember where the awards were that year. And uh, so I, it was, I, I was really surprised by when I was talked about in the press, it was a lot about what I wore. And I don't know if my male counterparts got that. And in one way, it's, it feels, um, I mean, there's so much more to me than what I wear. Mm. But I also went... Yes, this is working for me. Let's mm. go. And then you do that enough and then sometimes people send you clothes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can't afford to keep buying clothes. That hasn't happened to me. I'll, I'll send you the arms to go with that gilet. Yeah, Just exactly. in case it gets Just, it, Well, it might get colder later. <laughs> so you were doing MTV. Yeah. And there was this sort of dream job for this young woman, landed in a new city. Yeah. I mean, it's quite brave. In hindsight, I look back and I think, Jesus like, mm. That was a lot. Um, I don't think I realised at the time. I remember I got this job, a year's contract, to work for MTV in Camden. Had nowhere to live. Uh, so I remember coming over like the few weekends beforehand just to do a little bit of like flat hunting. Mm. Um, just flat shares, just looking up online on you know, a um, spare room or wherever. And, uh, so where were you looking? So mainly around Camden because... Uh, the um, MTV, MTV yeah, that's, is it still there? It's still there, um, and the studios are still there. But like, I remember, like Studio A was where all of the live sessions were. So like back in the day, in the nineties, like Nirvana performed there. You know, I've seen so many different people come in there. Like everyone went in there. Lady Gaga, her first performance, I think, was like in MTV doing a recording. Did you at the time have any concept of how lucky you were? I was just so naive I was just having and I loved my optimism like I look back now and there's bits sometimes I'm like oh with age you get a little bit you know I think you've seen too much mm. um but I was just having a lovely time it was hard and that I had no family I had no friends over there at bar like two girls yeah, my friend D who I'd met at DCU who was on an internship with uh, ID magazine she was working in fashion and then my friend Maeve, whose clothes I borrowed for the MTV Awards. Um, so it was hard. So that's why I ended up probably going out a lot because I was just like, will you be my friend? Now, when you were going out a lot yeah. as a younger person, were you, were, you, were you flying the Irish flag for the ability to go out 
and stay out. Well, can I tell you something? I it took me a while to get used to London because people don't um they go out earlier. Mm. So when I first when I first moved over and I remember one of the first people I interviewed uh, for MTV, who I won't name, asked me out for a drink that night. Okay. And I, who I, knows? you wouldn't even know. So I, <laughs> you wouldn't even know. <laughs> She's brushing over that one. <laughs> but I was like, great. And I think he said, oh, I'll meet you at um, like eight in this place. And I said, he said, he said, I'll be there with a the mate if you want to bring a friend. I was like, great, because I don't want to, like, I'll bring mm. my friend. My friend is Steve, because that's my only friend I had in Ireland. So he said eight. So of course, Mark, I went at 10 o'clock. Because mm. I'm, I'm not going to go at eight o'clock. He's there with friends. He'd left. He he ended up calling me and saying, oh, uh, is everything okay? And anyway, the place closed at 10. Yeah. The, see, it was like last orders were done. But that's such an Irish thing. Man. How's it going to go out till like midnight no, at home? But that is such an Irish thing. So my, my cousin Jane, who now lives over here. Yeah. Right. You say, meet us at two. Mm-hmm. Could arrive any time <laughs> between two and 6 p.m. And expect you still to be there. Yeah. And and ready to go for the rest, for the rest of, of the night. night. Like an Irish it's wedding. It's like, you know, I'm old now. I just I want to go home. I mean, now it suits me fine because I like a, I like an early night. But even my first wedding, one of the girls at MTV got married and I went to her wedding. That was over by midnight. Mm. I was like, where are we going? Where's the residence bar? What's happening? I mean, now it's good because I do need my sleep big time when I'm up early in the morning. But uh, it took me a while to adjust to that. After MTV. Yeah. You then sort of moved into more, you know, terrestrial, yeah. mainstream stuff. Yeah. And you did, obviously, uh, I'm a celebrity, celebrity for yeah. a long time. Yeah. But you were away. I mean, you had to, you, it wasn't like you were in a, you yeah. all decamped yeah. to Australia to do that. Yeah. I've, I've traveled a lot with work, which in one way has been lovely because I feel traveling is such a privilege because coming from, I love being Irish and I love Ireland, but I think we are natural travellers. Yeah. There's more people outside Ireland than there are in Ireland. Um, that's well, that fact. might be something to do with the potato famine. That might be, but I do think in general, even now with, um, like when I was younger, J1 visas in the in, in America, um, a lot of my friends, there's a great visa you can get to go off to Australia. Like Irish people do travel. Have you experienced the thing though? Because certainly when my father moved over, there was definitely a feeling of they're not mad keen on the ones who leave. So when you go back, there's a sort of attitude of, so you think you're special now, do you? <laughs> there is a, um, it's funny because there is a little bit of, I said this actually to one of the guys who was in the script. He says, the one thing people come up to me, Irish people and say, Asher, aren't you doing great? And there is a bit of it, you're flying the flag. Mm. It's lovely to hear an Irish accent. Um, it's hard. I feel sometimes I don't fit in anywhere. I feel uh, when I go back home, I'm almost, oh, you're English now or, you know, you're a West Brit. And then over here, they're like, oh, yeah, you're very Irish. So I don't fit in anywhere. I think you you have retained a healthy amount of Irishness. Thanks. I, I think you because the difficulty is if you're trying too hard to stay Irish, mm. you can come across as a bit cod. Yeah. And... I think it is about, well, you know. but I think it is about being adaptable, and, mm. and you know, the Irish are very good at molding to whatever environment yeah. that they're in as well, yeah. but remaining true to, to who they well. are. Yeah. And I was I, I was talking to Ryan Tuberty recently, and you know, we were talking about the fact that it is much easier to be Irish now than it used to be. Oh, completely. If we'd if I'd moved over here back, I listened to um, a podcast recently back like. And I work a lot with the London Irish Centre in mm. Camden. But in the 70s, I mean, you, if it can, me walking around looking to rent somewhere right. would have been a whole different ballgame. It's time for a little bit of food. Oh, but it's so nice. No, no, we, we, we'll start with something nice. Oh, I so, brought you something. Did you? Yes. Oh, well, hold on. Hand I've it got, over. So I was in oh, Ireland. Oh, Fortnum Mason's. How nice. No, 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 it's not. I just, oh, I, oh, it's I just, just had the bag. bag. Oh. <laughs> I always do that. I don't, you know, it's, it was just... I, I keep everything. I keep everything. Like we'll use that bag again. And um, so I was home, and I always stock up. So we've got a pack of the real tato, like the real oh, ones, the real, the red packet. The and red then this packet. is the best bar of chocolate you'll ever have in your life. The dairy milk golden crisp. Oh, so I've crisp. got here tato cheese and onion crisps, which yeah. which are the best. Crisps. The best in a sandwich as well. Walkers, mm. Sammy. 
plenty of butter, though. You I need do plenty. Like, I don't like the butter on what? it. I take them dry. Well, there we go. There's a rule for life. I take them there, dry. As you know, I, I put up a video eating Tato with no butter, and I got abused online by Gordon, not Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. Gordon oh, Ramsay. Well, what does he know? He doesn't know when I'm yeah. talking about. He doesn't know. <laughs> but, um, and that is good. Thank you. That is, honestly, I stock up. I've got so much at home until I run out and have to go back and get Now, back. this is the original Irish crisp yeah. for anybody, Tato. <laughs> and they, they, they're just the different. They're just different. You know, they like have a park at home now. They had like a, an amusement park, like Tato. Honestly, Tato I love world. it. world. I well, think I eat more Tato since I've moved out of Ireland than I did when I lived in Ireland. It's that comfort you're looking for. It's the comfort for. food, yeah. I'm going to get to those later. I won't be sharing them with you, Johnny, just to be clear. <laughs> Right. So when people come on this show, yeah. they have to answer a little question. Okay. Food loves. Yes, food I actually hates. forgot what I said. So what we're going to kick off with first okay. is an adaptation of one of your food loves. So you are obsessed by popcorn. I have a popcorn making machine at home. Oh yeah. Got what, the full, what the, the full? Huge. I'm... Now here I've got something. Hold on, that doesn't look like popcorn, what's that? That is, po- that is cockle popcorn. What's that, that mean? The chef here, Jamie, shares. So you know little cockles? Oh, alive, alive, oh. Yeah, cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. That is, that is a form of popcorn. It's a modern form of popcorn. Can I smell it? Is it hot or cold? Well, it was. It was. Oh, it's fishy. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're I love cockles. fish. Uh, They're cockles. I love fish. Oh. What do you want a cockle to be? Can I go in? Why, why? Well, do you, want, do you want some vinegar with it? Am I supposed to? Well, you, I, I, I taste one first. Taste one this, first. So... This is something that annoys me a lot. Mm-hmm. My husband and a few other people in my life, they'll get their plate of chips mm-hmm. or they'll get their soup or whatever it is and they'll just get either the vinegar or the salt and pepper and they'll just lather it on oh, before no. tasting it. No, no, no. Before That's, tasting it's it. The it's the height of bad manners. It's like, I taste it first. It's the height of bad manners. So I'm going to taste my As face. a cook, yeah. if anyone does that to my food before trying it, yeah. I, I will shout at them. But the same way, we get some soup sometimes and Ian will get Tabasco because he likes it spicy. I'm like, it could be spicy already. You don't know. And then you ruin it for yourself. Try it first. So I want to try it first and then I'll decide. Now, these are delicious. I love that. It's so me. So that's fine. How have I not had these before? I'll do a little bit, not too much. Yeah, well, here. Should we just put a little on the side plate there? Like, who am I? I'm going to use a fork. I'm going to use a fork. I'm going to... You're scared of getting vinegar on you. Dip it in there. Do you know what? It reminds me of the best uh, fish and chip shop in the world is in my hometown in Bray. It's called Henry and Roses. And they just put so much salt and vinegar, but it all goes straight to the bottom. Mm. So you're, you know, your last few chips are just so soggy. So I'm just that, gonna be sparse. So that's an adaptation on your guilty pleasure of popcorn. And I didn't realize exactly how obsessed by popcorn you were because you've actually got your own popcorn machine. I don't think I can put that in the machine though. No, you wouldn't put those in. But the, how lovely are those? I'm just going to go in again. Keep I just going. have to use my hand. These are... Go. I'm just going to put some on the place. Don't, don't, don't worry about the me. Fork. This is, everything tastes better if you eat it with your hands. I know, but I feel... It's such a like fancy surroundings. I feel... It's, it's fine dining. It's just yummy. Nobody can see. Well, oh, those people. Oh, those people. Yeah. yeah. Now, moving I on... Oh, <laughs> something <laughs> sh- I mean, it's something I think is... But you think is really oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, on, which I find utterly bizarre. Which... Hold on a second. I'm just going to get this from down here. Yeah. A raw mushroom. Yeah. And mayonnaise. Yeah. What on earth is called, wrong? It's called canopies. I used to. Um, can I say I went on Grace Dent's company eating podcast, mm. and I just mentioned this in passing. The amount of messages I got from people Quite thinking rightly. I'm insane. You are insane. I mean, I'm going to try it. But you know how I would do it? Because you've chopped these up really nicely. But what I would have done is, yeah. if when it's still like this. All right, so we take the, you take so, the stalk out. So I would take out. the stalk out. Right, so and then the I'd get, out. But this is really fancy. I would have got the squeezy mayonnaise and squeezed it in the middle. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, hold on. I'm going to try this now. So good. Hold on a second. Do you know how I first start doing this? Is that the right amount of mayonnaise? That's would you perfect. say that? That right. is perfect. So I'm now about to eat a raw mushroom. With some mayonnaise in it. Don't feel the need to, if, if you think I'm mad, send me messages because I already know I am. Um, mm. I don't that's what it was. No. I mean, look, oh, it's not terrible. You know but it's not mind-blowingly delicious either. Do you want to know why I started eating it like this? When I was a kid, and I used to play. No, it gets worse as it goes on. 
It's a little bit slimy. Mm. Um, I like oh, it. You see, what's what's hiding the fact is is the mayonnaise. Mm, not I eat them by themselves. What a raw mushroom on its own. No, yeah. I used to eat raw vegetables as a kid. I was such a weird kid. But that's probably quite healthy now. No, yeah. I mean there are raw foodists. Before are... yeah, before it was before there was crudités, I was eating my broccoli so and ahead, my carrots. So ahead of the so game. ahead. Style icon, food 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 dictator. <laughs> but I used to pretend. Me and my cousins used to do like fake restaurants. <laughs> did you ever do that as a kid? Yeah. Fake hotels. So I, I remember like in films, they always had this tray of like canopies that you'd go around. So I went to the fridge and thought, how can I recreate like a stuffed tomato? And all we had was mayonnaise and mushrooms. So that's what I did. And then I realized it tastes bloody good. Yeah, I don't it's think going. it's going to make it onto many menus. It's fine more for me. Well, don't go filling yourself up because oh, okay. we've got to that stage. Of I'm having a great time. <laughs> we've got to that stage in proceedings where oh, no. you have to don... It looks like a bra. It looks like a bra. Most people think it looks like a bra. For a very, very slight person. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to put it on my eyes. Yeah, put it on your eyes. So. Still have the mushroom taste. Well, no, cleanse cleanse your palate properly. Mm -hmm. Because when we remove sight, we've got to keep these senses alive. Because this is is where we test you. Okay. Do I have to guess what it is? Or I just say if I like it or not? Well, both. Okay. So we've got your first spoon here. I'm going to slide this across. The cloche is off. The people at home can see what this is. I don't smell anything. I'm always like... And this is your first mouthful. Open wide. Here we go. Oh, oh. What do you mean, oh, God? Tell me... There's, what... a, lot, there's a lot to comprehend. <laughs> Tell us what you can taste. There's what... definitely some sort of lettuce or something in there. There's a, there's a little sort of... Light garnish of and a crunch. And a crunch. What's the main flavour you're getting through now as you're chewing into it? It's really familiar. I can't think of what it is. It's definitely veggie. Mm-hmm. Thank God. Um, well, I'm not going to say. I that. liked it. You liked it. I have no idea what that is. Take the blindfold off. No, I actually have no idea what that is. We have succeeded because you said you hate onions. So <gasps> no, that, that wasn't was an a, onion. That was an onion tartlet with a that little bit of goat an cheese onion. and some pickled onion. And it's like loads of onions. Yeah, it's just an onion fest for you. With the whole you, onions. You, you were very clear on oh, your now, hatred of onions. Now I've got the aftertaste, though. Oh look, look, look! You see, no, that's only because you can see it, and I've told you. Now you, I've got. Now I've got no, bad breath. No, wait, wait, wait. Very wait, conscious. Wait, wait, wait! You said you loved that. I did Don't like go it, yeah. back on it just because you now know what it is. I hate onions. <laughs> but that's, you love that. I tell you, we didn't have would those you, onions. Would you eat the second spoon on blindfold? Oh, my God. That's a whole... Did I eat that? Yeah. Oh, gross. <laughs> what do you call them again? Those round things. That's... that's Like a scallion or something. No, that, what is it? That's a chipolini onion. That. Chipolini onion. Like, I wouldn't... Ne- no, I wouldn't eat that. You just did. Oh, I, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get, in Henry Rose's, the fish and chip shop, I used to get onion rings because I love batter. And I used to eat the batter and put the onions back in the bag. That's why I just wouldn't touch the onions. But correct me if I'm wrong. Did I actually though, eat a bit of that? Yes. You, the, you ate the, they were two exact the same mouthful. Yeah, but the aftertaste now. Now I stink. You do? You smell fine. But what are you worried about? You've eaten cockles and and, <laughs> and mushrooms. <laughs> There's with, a lot of really with bad With mayonnaise flavors. so far. I'm going to have to have one of these just to... Yes. Get we'll get you. We'll get your little. It's weird though. Once I knew it was onions, I just can't. Yeah, but you see, that's mad. Because when you had the blindfold on, you thought it was delicious. It was, but I, w- <laughs> I think it was the textures. There was a lot of different textures, like crunchy. I thought there was like lettuce in it there. It just tasted good, and you know it did. Okay, well, it takes a, a fine place to make me eat onions. So well done. It's not going to happen again. Well done, Jamie. Well done. Although she's gone back to her default position on onions, <laughs> despite despite eating it. So I can't believe there was onions. One of your memories yeah. that we've got your little something for. I'm just going to move that out of the way now. <clears throat> one of the memories, you don't have to put the blindfold on for this one, is down it's a here. Memory. It's a lovely memory. Okay. Hold on a second. Here it comes. Oh. Apple pie and custard. I mean, obviously, that's a Very Mount fancy. Street Mayfair <laughs> apple pie and custard. This is my favourite dessert. It's you so see. comforting. You see, we, we challenge and then we yeah. please. Okay, I'll eat an onion if I get to have apple pie and custard afterwards. Well, you've eaten the onion, so you can have a bit of that now if you like. Oh 
So this, this is going to be fancy custard, though. I'm used to the powdered stuff. The uh, birds, the birds. That's that's Michelle Rue Junior's favourite. Look at that! Oh my god, this is look the shape of this. I'm just going to do this. Look, fill them. Yeah, it's like one of your mushrooms. So you oh, can fill it up. See? Oh my god, she really I do like custard. I love custard. Honestly, you have emptied the whole jug of yeah. custard. This is not if like I could a, get just a bowl. If there was like a soup spoon, I, I tell you, I tell you what we need is a spoon. Is Hold on one second. I do need a spoon. I'm just going to check. It's okay. This is, I'm going to come back. In. This is so much fun. I feel bad for Claudia. I feel like she had a hard time on this. <laughs> she had a lovely time. She made a fuss about the rabbit. Rabbit. This, this is so. Oh. Is so it good? my um my next door neighbour growing up, Maureen, had an apple tree in her garden. So she used to let us take the apples and then my mom used to make stewed apple and um, apple pie and apple tart and then this Christmas I've started trying to tradition myself where I make an apple pie at Christmas time with the apples in our garden so we have an apple tree and then just absolutely drown it drench custard. it yeah. in custard yeah now how does that stack up against your mother's apple pie mm. this is Angie because it's got little pods in it you, you mean real vanilla real vanilla yeah yeah, yeah. And it's not as luminous as yeah, the bird. Yeah, you can't see it from space. I love that as well because that's quite deep. I like to put like loads of apples in. Yeah, well, well if you're having apple it. pie, you yeah. ha have some apples in it. But that... Yeah, but you know sometimes it can be one little small layer of apple. I go thick. Mm. Oh my God, this is so good. I had this on my um, wedding day as well, my wedding dessert. Mm. Yeah, wedding day was apple pie. Mm. Was it cooked by your mother? No, because she was there. She was having a day off. Okay. <laughs> now, here's the difficult question. Mm -hmm. Was your mother a good cook? Yeah. Yeah. She was. And um, I was a bit, like, so when I was 15, I stopped eating meat, red meat, mm. which in, you know, in Ireland. Not easy. Not ideal. There weren't a lot of choices. Yeah. Now it's fine living in London. Yeah. Um, you get into an home. Irish restaurant. What's the, what's the vegetarian option? Stay at home. It's, um, it's potatoes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's potatoes and um, the veg. Yeah. Even like, you know, Christmas Day and stuff, people can't understand you don't have ham. Even like having a carbonara, there's ham and everything. Even in like vegetables, they chop up ham. Or like in cold cannon, they'll chop up and put a bit of ham in. Well, it's like the Irish had potatoes. Yeah. Then they discovered pork. Yeah. And they, they, <laughs> they're, they're progressively yeah. moving into And your into rashers. Different. I feel sad because there's something quite like your your sausages, your Denny sausages and your you know, all these you know, comfort foods from home that I don't eat because I know what they are. And black pudding and white pudding, I used to eat loads of it when I was younger. I love white pudding. But then I found out what it was and I couldn't eat it. Well, it's like, hold on, it's not dissimilar to how you've approached the onion here. When you didn't know yeah, what it was. Yeah, but it's not dried you, blood. No, no but hold on. <laughs> but when you didn't know what the onion was, yeah. you thought it was delicious. As soon as you saw the onion, you then thought it was horrible. Oh, I'm not saying that black pudding isn't a white pudding. It's delicious. It's so delicious. That's the problem. But I know what it is now. And it, once I knew that, I couldn't I couldn't go back. The same with my husband. Um, their family, his family eats haggis. So they've now found a vegan haggis that I can have because I'm not going to eat haggis. No. Because I know what it is. Well, I mean, that's the thing with haggis, though. Yeah. Is there's no middle ground with haggis. There's either good haggis yeah. or god-awful haggis. Well, how do you feel about vegan haggis? I mean... Look, if it tastes good. Yeah. does does taste good. I, I, I didn't stop eating meat because it didn't taste good. I just, I stopped for like ethical reasons. And I didn't need it because I I, I love eating other foods and I eat enough. You still eat fish though. I still eat fish. So yeah. you're pescatarian. Pescatarian. I'm pescatarian. Now, you are in the middle of or have filmed this new series of documentaries. I've filmed already, yes. 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 Now, you've done what would be described as a lighter approach mm -hmm. in your presentation of things previously, you know, whether it's Love Island or MTV or or even, you know, Celebrity Juice. Yeah. This is a lot more hard-hitting what you're doing now. You know, the yeah. Laura Whit Whitmore investigates on ITVX. Mm -hmm. It's some quite heavy subjects. And what brought you to that? Well, I, I do work, I think I've been known to work in quite um, like, you know, entertainment-based uh, situations, but there's darkness in life. Like, I've dealt with darkness and seen darkness. Um, sadly, everyone has. Mm. Uh, and I think I needed an outlet to do that. And I think I have an audience from different jobs that I've had that maybe I could bring to watch this. Particularly, a lot of the issues, they're not just female-focused, but, you know, there's quite a few that are. 
uh, for example, I did one on rough sex, and that that only kind of came about from a survey that I saw with the amount of women, and actually it's it's been in the press again recently because the law has just changed, but the amount of women who had been killed by a partner um, where the defence used was rough sex and 60 plus women in the UK. And and I we also live in an age where BDSM is popular and you should be able to explore your sexuality as much as you want to and you shouldn't be embarrassed to talk about it. I went to school in a convent. I was taught sex education by a nun. Mm. I never really had the chance to talk about things the way I should. Um, so I think there's a real conflict with expectation of what sex should be for a young person, what they want, and that should be allowed to be explored to what are the boundaries and the most important word, which is consent. Uh, so I wanted to explore that and I didn't really know where it was going to take me. And it took me to some places that were really dark. It took me to places which were interesting. Like I went on a porn set. I, I the, mo- the thing I was most surprised about was the amount of conversations around consent before filming. And then I, I went and I met uh, this gorgeous man, Bob, who lost his daughter um, in the most horrific way possible uh, through choking during sex, uh, where the man um, was given six years. He's actually out now. Um, and I don't think we're talking enough about this. I think especially with the younger generation on TikTok and I grew up in age of porn, which wasn't as readily available you kind of, it was, you could get it, but, you know, dirty magazines or you'd like, v, hey, someone had a video, someone's dad, they found, whatever. But now you can just go online and find anything. And that's the one thing I explored within the video, what you can find and how easily. So we wanted to have those conversations um, from my perspective. Um, I saw a really interesting TED talk on the effect of pornography on mm-hmm. the male brain. Mm-hmm. And they tried to do a study of men in the States of college age, mm-hmm. they couldn't do the study because they didn't have a baseline. In other words, there was nobody not watching it. Yeah. And I think that is, I think it's a terrible thing in terms of, I think, you know, porn, if used correctly, mm-hmm. can help a lot of people in certain ways. Mm-hmm. But I also think that it creates a precedent particularly for young men as to what their expectations are. Exactly. So it's like a false um, view. Uh, and that was the one thing, I, and I ended up making another documentary, another film on incel behaviour, and mm-hmm. that's men who are involuntary celibate. Um, and the reason I made that film, it, they're all kind of linked, but they were all in their own space. Mm-hmm. But it was the pressures of men. So I'm, I end up talking to lots of young men who feel alienated. And I mean, in no way does it allow for the, the language and the belongs and the conversations I've seen online yep. from these men. But I was really intrigued why. Um, and you're right, the pressure. There's, there's a lot of men who've... There was one survey showing the amount of women who've been choked during sex where they haven't been asked, where a man has just seen it on something and he wants to... You know, he's not doing it with the intent to hurt but then I've also talked to medically trained doctors where it's like, you in any way um, stop air going through someone's brain and it can affect them. And there's a huge rise in women having strokes in their 20s and 30s. And there's um, a direct link to choking during sex or, or asphyxiation of some sort. I mean, I do. My my worry is for the next generation as I get older is. But what you're doing is talking about it is. It just gets pushed into the norm. Yeah. And it's... It's not questioned. Yeah, it's not questioned. And for some people it works, and for others it doesn't. But it's also the pressure then put on women to be this image of pornography within their their sex life to kind of sate Mm -hmm. an unnecessary need from young men Mm -hmm. it's like sex should be fun Mm -hmm. sex should be enjoyable Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of that and certainly what you cover in the rough sex thing is like i mean call me old-fashioned that doesn't look a lot of fun you know you know but it's that pressure to that's what everyone else is doing or that's what i should be doing and to just 
have a space to have that conversation and rather than judging, judging people who watch it or judging people who want to experiment, talk about it and understand. Even I went to a BDSM workshop um, and I just, I couldn't believe that the, the, the one thing they said was when I think of BDSM or when I think of sex games, the first thing that I think a lot of people play around with is choking because you don't need toys and you just use your hands. When I went to the BDSM workshop, the lady running it, it's such a weird place. To, it's such a weird to, I'm just sitting there going, I'm at a BDSM workshop, okay. Here's a paddle, okay, right, okay, let's get out of go. Um, but she was like, choking, no. Choking, no. Well, in my head, before I got into it, I was thinking, well, that's probably the, the tamest you can do. Mm. Well, actually, she was like, that's the one thing you don't do. You don't mess around with asphyxiation. You don't take, you don't, like breath play is dangerous. No. I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that as well. But I think the idea that there are people out there, you know, we laugh and so say, God, I was at a BDM yeah, yeah. S workshop or BDSM workshop. Yeah. That's good because someone's educating you. If you want to go down that route, yeah. let's do it properly. Yeah. I didn't even know they did workshops. I didn't know that was a thing. No. no. I mean, you've just told me. No, there you I go. didn't know. I'll that. give you the details after. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Um, did, did, did Ian mind you taking your work home? <laughs> do you know what? But a ge genuine thing, he was, um, I mean, not that he's control over what I do work wise, but I had to have a conversation, particularly with the incel one, saying, I'm going to go up to America and I'm going to interview these incels who hate women mm. um, and who've said these horrible things. And there is, and, and uh, you know, there's a few journalists who have worked in this area before who've received death threats and all sorts. So there was a bit of, okay, am I putting my family at risk? Am I putting myself at risk? Like, why am I doing this? So, from that side of things, we had to have. And also, it's it's weird because I'm so used to working um, on live telly or live radio. So when you work on a show, it goes out. Everyone knows what you've done. You've talked about it and you move on. When you film something, like I filmed a lot of this like a year ago, mm. and you film it and you deal with it then. And then it's only now people are watching it saying, oh my God, do you need to be that guy with the mask? And what was that about? And I'm like, oh yeah, like it's 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 a delayed, it's, it's a different dynamic. So. Sometimes I was doing that stuff and it felt I didn't really talk to anyone else. I talked to a psychologist, which is the first time I've ever had a psychologist work with me on a show because I felt like I needed to because I didn't I couldn't have that rapport with other people because they didn't really know what I was doing at the time. So it's 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 still presenting, but it's in a very different way that I had to kind of get my head around. And obviously, having covered what are very sensitive subjects within this, has your opinion on things changed as a result of immersing yourself in that world like for example i know it's probably a stretch but did you feel any compassion towards an incel for example yeah and that really messed me up a little bit there's, there's one guy there's one scene when i'm interviewing this guy with a mask and um i just wanted to, i almost wanted to give him a hug because as soon i, I there's a, i think it's about a few minutes 10 minutes maybe in the actual doc but i talked to him for over an hour and by the end of it, he was talking about the abuse he had from his mother. Like, it all went back. In my head, I'm like, okay, this all makes sense. Mm. And you've, you've somehow slipped through. And you've got to the stage where you were thinking these thoughts and saying these things and making these videos. And even things like he'd say, oh, this girl was in front of me and she held a door open for me. So I got the door and slammed it in her face. How dare she emasculate me like that? So, like, wild ideas. And I'm sitting here going, I should hate you, but you're also... What, what made you like this? And broken. What what got you to this? And I I, I think all of us in, in no matter what your job is, we just need to have. I'm not saying I condone uh, you know things that he says, but there has to be that empathy for everyone. I, I think but, compassion. Rather yeah, than not empathy. Um, yeah, maybe compassion. But there was one guy, Sam, who I interviewed um, after, and he had these videos, which are horrible videos online, and I met him. And he's turned his life around and he's got a job, a girlfriend, and I just I just couldn't believe it he was the same person. So there's that ability of to change. And I think that's what we need to be a bit because we live in such an aggressive world. You know, it's, it's such a, yeah, online if you say anything, people just jump, you know, people there are atrocities happening in the world that no one will say anything about because they're too scared they'll say the wrong thing. I was like, say it. Say what you feel. If you feel like you've offended someone, apologise, move on, move forward, but talk about it. Stop pretending things aren't happening. Well, I think it's you've hit the nail on the head there because all of the subjects you cover yeah. within this documentary series can be the 
problems within them can be alleviated by the simple act of talking openly and mm-hmm. honestly mm-hmm. about these things yeah. and educating people. Because, you know, if you're talking about incels, these are people with pent up, pushed down emotions around things that have happened to them that they haven't been able to discuss. So um, they start um, lashing out. Or they're trying to find a community. Like a lot are young men who are being radicalized by a small group of people, like your Andrew Tate's. Um, who are kind of almost preying on these vulnerable men mm. uh, and all they want is a community and suddenly they're like, oh, so I'm going to say, uh, and actually one guy I interviewed in the UK, he, one thing he put up, I was like, I questioned him, I challenged him, I said, why would you say that in a video? And he went, oh, for likes, for engagement, because when I when I say something well, we, all, we all want to be liked. We all want to be it's liked. It's just a but, question of what, what would you do? What yeah. would you do? Well, Talking of likes. Yes. I mean, this is the most bizarre segue of all time. Good. I'm ready for this link. Hold on, but, let me get a little bit of custard and <laughs> prepare myself for the best link of my life. Go. Well, talking of likes, we've got to <laughs> your final spoon. Oh. So it is time to put okay. the blindfold on once again. Is this again. a nice one? Well, who knows? I can't tell you that. It's the onions one that I'm still not over. I can still taste it in my breath. I've got custard onion breath with cockles. We'll get you some chewing gum or some listerine afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So I'm just going to move. Can I ask you a question? What are cockles? Are they like mussels? Yeah. They're just like small, they're they're smaller a, ones. Just another little bivalve. Okay. Lives in a ship. Okay. So that, obviously growing up, we all knew in Dublin First City for the girl yeah. that's so pretty. Yeah. Molly Malone. Right. Okay. Here is your finals. Final spoon. Okay. Open wide. Here it comes. <laughs> oh, what wow. I've just had sweet and dishes of savoury. Well, that was your own fault. Oh. Oh, what are we getting now? Is that Christian? Huh. Potato. Yep. And your other all-time favourite ingredient. Cheese. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God, they're cheesy chips. Yes. Oh, my God. So, in your questionnaire... Ah, uh, where's the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we had to put them on a spoon. But in your questionnaire... That's lovely. What, what, what was it from the... Chinese takeaway. A th- <laughs> <laughs> so I once, um, I had to do something recently if I was talking about Irish food growing up and I realised none of them are very traditional. I'm like, oh, so we go to the Chinese and get a three in one. Now like, what's a three in one? So I thought growing up that was Chinese food. Yeah. But it's, I'm, I'm learning it's not. No. And I've been to China and I did not get a three in one. No. So a three in one is chips, um, rice yeah. and a curry sauce. Um, so that was what's on that one. So that's jalapeno. Oh, that's cheese, that's that's jalapeno. cheese and jalapeno. And then you'd get in Supermax, um, you'd get chips, cheese, and garlic mayo. And that would be at three in the morning after a night out. So that, like, when I'm talking about what oh, I ate growing up. always comes back to chips. Always comes back to type And potato. cheese. Do you know when I was pregnant, all I could eat was potatoes? I literally gave birth to a potato. Just different types of potato. Like mashed potato. For dinner, I'd have mashed potato, because otherwise I just feel sick or get sick. All beige. Mashed potato. Maybe a roasty and some chips. Yes, potato many ways. <laughs> Whereas my wife, Susan, when she was pregnant with Harry, Haribo Tang Fastic. Oh, they're good as well. But I mean, I think my husband them. must be pregnant because he <laughs> adores them. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's a changing. What changing a way to world find out. Living. Yeah. It's a changing world. So you like that spoon? Yes. Would you eat the second spoon voluntarily? Yes. Well, go on. Now, wait, how hot is this jalapeno? Can I just get rid of that fella? I thought you liked spicy. Or is that the husband? Well, he's more into the spice. I'll have a little bit. Um, My wedding cake was cheese. It was just different layers of cheese. What, wheels of cheese? cheese, So what, like a a, a brie? All of it, yeah. Cheddar, camembert, all of them. I don't even know what we got by the top. There was so much cheese. There we go. Mm. Enjoy that final. There's two types of cheese in this. There's like yeah, a melty there's cheese. There's a melty cheese and a parmesan. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Double it's cheese, cheese. Well, it's not me. It's Jamie. Like Jamie portion. Shears. Well, we'll 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 <laughs> we'll order down for some more of those for you. But I would just like to say thank you so thank much you. for agreeing to put on the blindfold and try the spoons. It's been an education. I've Although I thought I knew you, I know you better now. You know, I've loved everything, and even the dish that I shouldn't have loved, I quite liked. Yeah. I've got to admit it. You like onions. All right, good. I liked it. Good. A huge thank you to Laura. And of course, you can see her fantastic documentary series on ITVX. That is it for spooning for this week. 
Of course, I will be joined again next week by a very special guest who will be trying the spoons they think they love and the spoons that they think they hate. All of it cooked here at the Mount Street Restaurant by Jamie Shears. Massive thanks to him and the team, of course. Now, if you like what we're doing, you can find us at Spooning with Mark Wogan across all your social media channels. We're also available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, subscribe, give us some likes, reviews, whatever you see fit. But until then, stay beautiful.